wrestling with difficulties, finding a way to trust, even in the hard times. You need to know that, that I'm, I'm not against great faith. I want to make this real clear, you know, believing for great victories, believing for wonderful exploits and answers to prayer, believing for great deeds. But I just want to highlight the dignity of struggling in the life of the Christian and also in the eyes of our Lord. Mm -hmm. You're in the fight of your life. Yes. Amen. No more goody two-shoes Christianity, not for you. You must scratch and claw for your very existence. Our enemy, the devil, has taken his gloves off. It is an all-out brawl. If you're going to make heaven your home, and if you plan to take your family members with you to heaven, then you must demonstrate a faith that fights for all it's worth. Amen. Amen. Faith that fights. It's time for round four. All right. And as we begin this morning and prepare to look into God's holy word, I want to ask you a question. Actually, I would like for you to ask this question to yourself. Don't answer out loud, but I want you to be thinking about it as the sermon progresses. And here it is. Am I free? Am I free? Can you really say that you are free? Is there any area of your life that remains in bondage? Over the course of this series, four weeks, the first week was about surrendering completely. You've got Jesus in your corner. The second week, this was basically the thought you were headed to hell, you were lost, but just in time Jesus rescued you, you were saved. Last week, the third week, um, I advised you to take a dive. I said, uh, take a dive. That's a, a boxing phrase. Let me just say a little bit more about that. The, the point was for you to lose yourself entirely to Jesus. Here's some verses. Jesus says, if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you must become the servant of all. Jesus says, the last will be first and the first will be last. Jesus says, give, and it will be given to you. The point is, these verses, these are just, they're countercultural. They're anti-American. They go against the grain. This is against everything that we've been raised to believe. But basically, this is the idea. Put Jesus first, and put your own desires in the background. That's the way God's kingdom works. Take a dive. This is the final round today. Let me set the stage for the fight. Don't fight against God. The Bible speaks of a fighting that happens where an individual finds themselves fighting against God. If you're fighting against God, that is a battle you will lose. Don't fight against God. And don't fight against yourself. James writes about a fight that's going on inside of yourself. Fighting and quarrels that come from passions and desires that battle inside of you. Don't fight yourself. We're not talking about fighting against God. We're not talking about fighting against self. We are talking about fighting against a very real enemy who is embedded strategically in the spirit realm. Now, round one, I told you, throw in the towel. Remember that? Surrender. Round two, saved by the bell. You've been, you've been saved just in the nick of time. Round three, take a dive. It means lose everything. Let him be in control. Not me in control. He's in control. And today, my fight tip to you is round four, go toe to toe. What kind of picture does that give you in your mind? I mean, toe-to-toe, -to -toe, face to face, a brawl, a fight against your enemy. Fight for all you've got. You see, here's the thing. The enemy of your soul doesn't think about 
what you're going to have for lunch later on. Your enemy is not thinking about a TV show later in the afternoon when you can unwind. Your enemy could care less who wins the PGA tournament. All he thinks about 24-7, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, all he thinks about is this, how will I make sure he goes to hell? How will I make sure she goes to hell? That's all your enemy thinks about. All the time. That is the job description. And it's very clear in John chapter 10, and verse number 10, it says, the thief came to steal and to kill and to destroy. That's what the devil does. The book of the Revelation gives a description of God joining in the fight. And it's so powerful. There's a verse in the Revelation that says, it will soon come to you, and I will soon come to you, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. This describes God as fighting so hard that it comes from a word that literally means vibrating, shaking, have you ever seen wrestlers or fighters who are absolutely spent? I mean, they've given it all their energy and they're just shaking. It describes God that way. God's so furious against the enemy that he's just... I'm glad he's in my corner. Right here. The, in fact, the word that's used in the Revelation is a word that means to put your hand on the opponent's neck. Oh, what a picture. This is the fight against spiritual wickedness. And that's what the fight is about that I'm talking to you today. Not fighting against God. Not fighting against self. Joining myself with God to fight against the enemy. So I want to read a familiar passage of Scripture that talks about this fight against spiritual wickedness. Round four, the final round. Let's go toe to toe. Here we go. You ready? Yeah. Go with it.
Oh, listen, all of this series, I've been promising you that we would engage in spiritual warfare. I wanted to give you the tools to equip you for spiritual warfare. And today, I want to speak plainly about going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the enemy, face-to-face -face against the enemy, going head-to-head -head against the enemy. I want to share with you three points today. And the first one is this. Be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. That is the precise wording of Scripture. It's like we said last week. You've got to put in the road work. You've got to build yourself up in the faith. Listen to me. Get buff in your spirit, man. How do you do that? You pray. You read the Word. You are faithful to church. And you build strong Christian friendships. And if you will do that, then you're going to begin to be strong in the Lord. Look at this. Verse number 10 says those exact words. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Be strong. Why? Why should we be strong? Because of who we are fighting against. That's why. Verse number 12 tells us this. It says our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We are fighting against evil. Yes, we are. Yeah. So we have to be strong in the Lord. There was a fight in 1951 between Rocky Marciano and Joe Lewis. Marciano had just absolutely, go ahead and roll it. Marciano had, had just been decking Joe Lewis. I mean, just beating him around the ring. Finally, he knocked him right out of the ring. I, can you believe that? I mean, he just, bam, he just knocked Joe Lewis completely out of the ring. Now, I don't want you to just win against the devil. I want you to knock his lights out. I don't want you to barely make it into heaven by the skin of your teeth. I want every demon in hell to be afraid that you're coming their direction. If you're going to win, then you've got to have this ability to discipline yourself. You have got to be strong in the Lord. Some of you have gotten sloppy. You are not strong in the Lord. Your prayer life is suffering. You need to work out like you used to. You're weak. Don't let that happen. The way that you go toe to toe, the way that you go face to face against your spiritual enemy in this battle is to pray. Yes. Amen. And that is the second point, and it's here. Number two, put on the armor. Don't accessorize. Put on the armor. Some of you recognize this phrase from fashion world. Don't accessorize. The great emphasis in this text is in putting it on. Having it in place. See, there's not some deep spiritual revelation about truth that you have to understand. You just need to put it on. Yeah. Amen. 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 You, you do not have to have someone explain the mysteries of the helmet of salvation. You just need to put it on. Amen. I'll show you what I mean. In this text, look, verse 11 says, put on the full armor of God. The emphasis is on putting it on. Verse 13, put on the full armor of God. There it is again. And then you see it all through this text. 
Down at verse number 14, where it talks about the belt of truth, it says, uh, with the belt of truth buckled. Key word. You have to have the belt of truth buckled. Does you no good to have truth dangling around your waist if it's not secure? The breastplate of righteousness in place. It does me no good to have the breastplate of righteousness if I'm not guarding my heart with righteousness. Have it in place. Look at the next part, verse number 15. Your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Fitted. The emphasis in the text is on fitted. Put the shoes on. Don't collect them like a bunch of Nike Air Jordans in your closet. Put them on your feet. Put, put your faith where your feet are and have them in place. And then notice this wording, take up the shield of faith. Why does he even have to say that? Because some of us, we've got this shield and it's sort of sitting over in the corner. It's brandished, it's polished, it's pretty. We like to display it on our shelf. And he's saying, no, no, no. That's not the point of the shield of faith. Take up the shield of faith. Take it up and use it. Take the helmet of salvation. The emphasis is on taking it. And the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Take the sword of the Spirit. You see, it does no good to have all of this shiny armor hanging in your closet. That's right. That's right. That's right. You have to put it on. Some of you, you, you can't seem to get victory. I just, I'm so beaten up and I've been just knocked down. You've got to fight. Hey, I know it's hard. Listen, I hear some of the stories and my heart breaks as I'm talking with different ones and just praying, God, help them. But you have got to fight with everything that's in you. Fight, fight, fight. Don't ever give up. Take that shield of faith. Put the belt of truth on. Have your head guarded with the helmet of salvation. Put the breastplate of righteousness over your heart to guard you. Take up the shield of faith. You're in a war. You are in a battle for your very existence. Yes, right. Oh, I don't know if I want to wear this shield and this helmet. Helmet, they don't match. No. <laughs> Not very fashionable in today's culture. Does this belt of truth make my butt look big? <laughs> Come on, brother. Take it away. See, this is not a game. That's right. Yeah, it's not. This is a battle for your life. These are not accessories. The armor is like a bulletproof vest. That's right. The armor of God is like a life preserver. Yes. It doesn't matter if it's orange and ugly and doesn't fit in with the fashion of the times. You put it on Amen. so that you can be rescued. That's right. Amen. The third point is to engage in battle. Get some chinks in your armor. Think about this. Most of the armor that's mentioned here in Ephesians chapter 6 is for defense. Defensive maneuvering. Think about the way it's worded. The helmet. The shield belt, breastplate, shoes. These items are for defense. But there's two things mentioned that are all offensive weapons. Prayer and the Word of God, the Gospel of Jesus Christ. These are offensive weapons. Prayer is powerful. 
Just listen to, take notice how many times Paul says to pray. Verse 18, pray in the Spirit. It says with, with all kinds of prayer. Go to the next slide if you would. Pray in the Spirit with all kinds of prayer. And then uh, pray also for me. And then verse 18, keep on praying. And then verse number 20, pray that I might declare it fearlessly as I should. So five times, get that, in three little verses, five times in three verses, 18, 19, and 20, Paul says pray. Prayer is critical for our survival. It is our lifeline. It's our, it's our communication. When we've been dropped in behind enemy lines, it's the way that we communicate with our commanding officer. Prayer is critical for your survival. Um, recently, I downloaded a new app for my phone. And... Um, it's, it's this app that provides a, an alarm clock system that um, it records your sleeping patterns. It's real interesting. Uh, it tells me when, when I'm in REM sleep, like rapid eye movement, and when I'm in deep sleep patterns. So um, when I wake up in the morning, I can look and see through the night um, you know, how, how I did on my sleeping patterns, and it will even wake me up at the right time in my sleeping pattern closest to when I set the alarm clock. So uh, my typical get-up time is 5.20 a.m. When, when 5.20 comes, it might wake me up a little bit earlier than that or maybe a little bit later than that, depending on where I'm at in my sleep pattern. It's just really uh, amazing the way it understands those cycles. I don't know how they do that. That's... Absolutely remarkable. Um, it also, this app, it also records sounds. Oh. Sounds that wake me up. <coughs> dogs barking. I've had sound recordings of, oh, there was a dog barking at 3 a.m. Cars racing down the street. <laughs> you can hear it going, oh, that went off. That kind of disturbed my sleep. Um, it records my sounds in the night. Every snore, everything. It records every sound that comes out of my mouth. I found out some really interesting things about myself. Um, when I'm sleeping, I go through a cacophony of all these different sounds that I can't believe my wife has put up with this for 25 years. <laughs> I was amazed by the sounds that come out of my mouth. Um, th these are not fake. You're going to hear it. I'm going to share it with you. These are not fake sounds. These are the real deal. These are actual sounds. And I, I want to let you in on a recent night's sleep that I had. Go ahead and play that. Let's listen to this. I've given a name to each one of these sounds. 12.45 a.m., just a cacophony of animal sounds. Crank it up. <laughs> so I saw, saw some logs there, catching some Z's. And then at 2.13 in the morning, the sound of a walrus caught in a fishing line. by at 2.30 a gentle camel slurping from the water trough. <laughs> now at 4.30 in the morning interesting things start to happen. The king of the jungle, the lion with a big flapping flabby lips. 
I think you just hear it. <laughs> Fifteen minutes later, a rhinoceros with low guttural respiratory infection. <laughs> I know, I, yeah, me too. <laughs> and then after that, um, you've got this horse with nasal congestion. <laughs> Bless your heart, honey, for putting up with this all, all these years. It's followed by a series of whale sounds. Sounds like steam coming out of the whale spout. And she blows. And then at 4.59 a.m. the rhino returns, <laughs> angrier than ever. And, and apparently the rhinoceros scared the whales out of the harbor because now, after that at 5.03 a.m., a series of distant whale calls. They're in the distance. <laughs> and finally I end up with, just before waking up, a gorilla grunt. There he is. <laughs> I mean, that would wake you up too, right? <laughs> now, you know me, I just couldn't resist. I wondered what it would sound like to put it all together. Here's the remix. All of them at the same time. <laughs> Some of you young people are looking for a new beat to throw down with your rap. I mean, I, that would be hot right there. Um, my wife has lived with that for 25 years. Th this is how she gets rest with that going on in the background. Um, this album is not available in your local store. No animals were injured in the recording of this project. Um, you know, actually, it took, it took me a while to decide to let my two boys hear that because they could use it against me. And I decided to do it live with no lead-in, just the surprise factor, because otherwise they would have had me posted on Facebook already. They would post me, so, um, yeah. Listen. The point is, if you were in your bed, in your bedroom, sleeping at three in the morning, just really in deep sleep, and if I walked into your bedroom, and got right down by your bed and screamed in your ear, wake up! You would be mad at me. <laughs> and you would have a right to be mad at me for doing something like that to you. But what if I followed that scream, wake up, with the words, the house is on fire. Now, suddenly, everything changes. We are at a desperate place in America. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, we are. And God is calling His church to wake up. Yes. Amen. Yeah. God is saying to the sleeping giant, Get up from your slumber. Get out of bed. Yes. 
This is not a time for resting. This is an all-out war. Yes. You might have to sleep in a foxhole, but you are in battle, doing battle in the heavenly realms for the safety of you and your family and your neighbors and your friends and people who do not know Jesus, who will spend eternity somewhere. Right. So we must wake up. Yes. Amen. I want to call the worship team back up here, guys. Would you guys, could you come back and get in place? And Zach, just lead us in whichever song seems right to you. There have been times in the history of the church when when she has drifted off. I think of some of the some of the horrible things that happened in medieval times as as the church, the representation of the church of Jesus Christ to the world became so cold and orthodox and rigid and that they they drifted. I think about the Inquisitions, especially the Spanish Inquisition. Some of the horrors of what the representation of God to the people, what it, what it became. I think about the Crusades where in a very real sense, people became militant and vigilant when really what should have happened was the spiritual battle needed to be conducted on our knees. Think back to the Old Testament times. I know it was not the church yet, but the people of God under Josiah, a young guy that became a king, eight years old, became king. And at some point in his tenure, as he just kept seeking God and, and trying to make the temple the right way and, and to see it repaired and all of this, at some point somebody brought him the scroll of Moses. It had been left up in the aqueduct. At, at one point, probably there was a raiding army that came in and, and they took the scrolls and, and hid it. The Word of God, the, the very commandment of God was, was just stashed away in the aqueduct. And when, when they brought it to Josiah and he read it, the, the revelation hit him so strong. Oh my Lord! We're not doing what this book says we're supposed to be doing. We are in danger. And he, he called the whole kingdom to fasting and prayer. And he put on sackcloth and ashes and, and repented and cried out to God. And God says, it's too late. Judgment is coming. It won't happen in your lifetime, though. I will grant that you have humbled yourself before me. But it will come. And it did come. Listen to me, I know that we cannot, we can't change what God has set in place. He orchestrates the rise and fall of nations. He orchestrates the rise and falls of kings and kingdoms, presidents and heads of state. He raises those individuals up. We pray for them. I don't know where we are in the curve. I'm not a prophet. I can only say, I would not be surprised at all if we're very close to the end. I wouldn't be surprised at all. In the middle of last century, um, in 1939 in Germany, there was a tyrant rising to the throne. The head of the Third Reich, Adolf Hitler, he was an evil man. He killed people. Senseless massacres. 
And he proclaimed himself that, yeah, I'm a, a Christian. And a thousand pastors joined with him. A thousand German pastors said, Adolf Hitler is a man of God. There was one who said, this is nonsense. Dietrich Bonhoeffer went on the radio and over the airwaves proclaimed truth. And his radio message was cut off in the middle of the broadcast. <laughs> Silence went off the air. He later attempted in a coup attempt, he attempted to, to kill Hitler. And the coup failed. And he, along with others, went to concentration camp. And on June 9th, 1945, just days before the Allies came in to set the camp free, Hitler gave the order, make sure that Bonhoeffer dies. So he was hung on April 9th. I think there are certain heroes that rise above cultural norms to say there are certain things that are just right. I thank God for our nation. We're blessed to live in the most wonderful nation on planet Earth. And even with all of her faults and failures, we are so much better off than so many other nations. I, I thank God. God for America. And I pray for our leaders. I pray for our nation. And I am calling you, church, let's get out of bed. Right. Let's fight for the things that matter. Right. Who is going to join me in this fight for decency and purity in our nation to stand up for godly marriage and for godly values and, and family values? Who will fight? Who will hit their knees and pray for our elected leaders covering them so that they know the mind of Christ? Who will even be willing to run for public office if that's what it takes to change things so that our values for our nation are restored. Amen. I want you to take your Bible and if you, like a lot of you, you're not bringing the physical Bible with you, you like to use the device, that's fine. Whatever you use for your Bible, I want you to hold it in your hand. By the way, let me just say this. Everybody hear me on this. I thank God for technology. But if this is your Bible, it better be pure. <coughs> Don't you be reading the Bible on one app and looking at filthy pictures on another one. That's right. That's right. Take your Bible in your hand. The Word of God is a sword. The Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces to the dividing of joints and marrow and soul and spirit. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. I want you to take your sword in your hand. I want you to repeat after me. In fact, let's all stay, everybody in the room, let's stand our feet. Father, right now we are engaging in a battle for our existence. Kind of like Jehoshaphat in his situation, he cried out, Lord, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. We see violence and drugs in our nation. It breaks our heart. Sometimes we feel hopeless about that. Give us new hope, God. We see that Abortion is such a, a formidable foe in our nation. Sometimes we feel hopeless. We don't know what to do. 
but we stand upon your word, God. So many families breaking up, so many divorces happen, sometimes we feel hopeless. But God, we are in this battle to fight. We will stand upon your word. We will hit our knees in prayer. We will bring about a prayer revival in our nation. God, we will be the ones to touch your throne. And we won't let up until we see victory. Because it's just got to be better than this, God. It's got to be better than this. So we take the word of God, the sword of your spirit, and we pierce. I want you to pierce the darkness right now. You take your Bible and you use it like a sword. We pierce the devil. We cut off every wicked thought. We bring every thought obedient to Christ. We take your sword. We tear down every stronghold. This word of God that is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. We tear down strongholds with the word of God. God is mightier. God is stronger. God is powerful. You told us to do this. You said pray in the spirit on all occasions. Pray in all kinds of ways. This is the way we're praying, Lord. We're taking this Bible, this symbol of your power and your authority, and we cut the enemy. We tear him to pieces. We will not back down. Satan, I declare that you are defeated. You must cease and desist your activities all over Buckeye. You are broken. You are defeated. The word of God is more powerful than you. You are a thief enemy of our souls you are defeated you are a defeated foe you are destroyed by the authority of the risen Christ Zach begin to lead us in worship I want you to engage, engage in worship, enter in, do damage in the heavenly realms, tear down spiritual wickedness and strongholds off of your life, off your family's life.